Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. You have been faithful. And from the depths of our despair, you always lift us up. I have an exciting word to present to you today. Okay. Okay. Well, let's do it then. Let's get in Philippians chapter 1 together. I'm just going to share two verses that introduce two different sections of Philippians chapter 1, and then I can come back and fill it in. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, and I am bogged down in this chapter, can't do it justice in the time that's allotted today, but I do my best, where Paul says, Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. That's one heading, and then go to verse 20. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always… Boy, Paul's really sticking his neck out here, isn't he? He's facing a trial before Caesar, and he's boasting of the power of God, and he said, you know, I, I have a feeling that whatever happens to me, that God's going to use it. And so I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Just like God saw me through before, he's about to show himself strong on my behalf in this situation too. Now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Rather than a title today for the message, I'm going to be teaching a little bit more than I'm going to be preaching. So I want to use a question to get you thinking today. And the question is, are you headed in the right direction? Are you headed in the right direction? And we'll do our best to consider that and take a look at it. But let's pray before we sit down and learn. Lord, open our hearts. Your word needs good ground if it is to grow and produce. So we ask you, till us, open us, and make us receptive and ready. Somebody say, I'm ready. Tell the Lord, say, I'm ready. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, band. I just love our worship teams so much. I love our production teams, our parking teams. I love our children's ministry teams. Somebody told me that the E-Kids album might have been a Billboard album on the chart or something like that. That's pretty cool, on the Billboard charts with the kids' album. I, I didn't verify it, but it sounds cool, so I just thought I'd say it. We'll look it up later. Look, look here, because I want to I wanna teach today, and I need… A little bit of grace. See, about my handwriting, it's going to make you question whether or not you can sit under a pastor with the level of intelligence that my handwriting indicates. I have sent people birthday cards before, handwritten birthday cards, because I'm a, I'm a good man, I'm a thoughtful person, and they didn't have any more courtesy than to respond to me talking about my handwriting on the handwritten birthday card. Never mind what I said, the words of life that I spoke into their soul. They say things like, wow, do you, do, you, do you get your kids to write the birthday cards for you? Did Abby write that for you? And well, that's just mean. So I figured that you're not that type of people, that you are loving and accepting. And, and the message I want to use today requires a little bit of writing. I want to write some words on the board and kind of teach from that standpoint. So I, I want to plead for your forgiveness of my handwriting, if you'd be willing to forgive me for my handwriting in advance. And for anything that I misspell, because there's no spell check on a whiteboard. And so we're going to try to do it, but you know, just kind of to break it down. And I want you in the posture of a learner uh, today so the message can last past when I finish preaching it and go into your week with you. So you may want to write some of these things down. And um, the first thing that I want to mention from the text and really from life is progress. Because they say, they say, anything sounds official if you started with they say. They say that 
one of the basic elements and requirements of human happiness is a sense of progress. You can't be happy in a sustained way if you don't feel like you're making progress in, in life and in different areas of your life. And I think that's true. Maybe I'm a little bit more ambitious than most, most people. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not most people. I'm me. But I, I certainly need a sense of progress to stick with something. Yeah, I, I don't show up for something that's not working. I don't just show up again and again and again and again if it's not working. I'll just, I'll just stay home. And uh, by the way, that's why some men quit their marriages. Because it feels like they never get back to that original state of love that they had. And so it feels like they're going backwards in the relationship. And a man won't show up to play a game that he never can win at. And women too. I mean, it goes both ways. But we all need a sense of progress. Everybody say progress. Yeah, you sound good today. You sound like you want to make progress. I sat down with some of our staff members this week and coached them for different areas. Uh, you, you do know that I work between Sundays, yeah? So in leading the church, one of the things that I um, am privileged to do, not as much as I would want to, but sometimes I get to do uh, a one-on-one -on -one session or group session of coaching. And uh, three of the staff members who are in their 20s asked a variation of the same question. I thought it was interesting. And, and the idea was, I do a lot in ministry and I work hard, but it's hard for me to tell, am I making a difference or is it effective? And essentially, they're asking, am I making progress? Because I don't mind working hard. I'm a hard worker, but I need to know that it's working. And in ministry, that's hard to tell sometimes because you don't often go home with a checked off list. It's not like you uh, mowed seven lawns today and you can see the progress. And so it's, it's very difficult to see ministerial progress. And uh, Paul certainly knows something about that who's writing in the book of Philippians, uh, progress. If progress then is essential to human happiness, and if we can't feel satisfied and fulfilled in our lives without progress, either as moms or as husbands or as employees in a church or as business owners or as students or as Christians, then, then how do we make progress? And so you would say to me, and you would be correct, that effort is essential to progress. It amazes me, by the way, how something that sounds so simple and seems so obvious seems to have skipped a whole generation. Talk to me. How in the world do you expect progress without effort? How do you expect to ace what you didn't study for? How you expect to burn something off when you won't move what you got? Touch somebody, say effort. So I need effort if I'm going to have progress, right? I need to push towards something. I need, I need to move towards something. I, I, need, I need effort. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take effort. However, what I would suggest to you today, kind of my thought pattern, is that effort alone does not produce progress. Effort alone is not enough. Now, you know this if you've had a kid with a learning disability, and some of you are, are school teachers. You can, you can give a kid more and more and more and more work, but if they are not learning correctly the way that they need to learn, they'll eventually conclude, I'm not a good student because they're not making progress, and the effort doesn't help it. Can I tell you another thing? You, you won't make progress just because you're passionate about something. Passion is not enough for progress. You can sincerely want to make something better. I, I see people who sincerely want to get in better shape, but never learned how. So we don't just need effort because you can see people who go to the gym six days a week and don't look like it. Oh, it's quiet. <laughs> it's quiet because you've been there effort alone does not produce progress. I give you a little bit fuller uh, equation. Effort plus direction equals progress. I thought y'all would say amen to that. I mean, I know it's real common sense on one level, is, is that in order to make progress, I got to know that I'm headed in the right direction. I preach from Charlotte. If we want to go to Columbia, South Carolina, or Miami, Florida, and I head north, I might get there quick driving 90 miles an hour, but is it progress? 
Progress is determined by destination and my proximity to the destination. I'm trying to say that if you get turned around the wrong way, you'll get there fast. But when you get there, you'll realize this ain't Miami, this ain't Columbia, because I didn't have direction. Now, I mean, I drove hard. I had my hand on 10 and my hand on 2, but I woke up in the wrong place because progress is more than effort. Progress is effort in the right direction. Now, I bring it up because could it be in your life that you've been pointing your effort in the wrong direction, feeling tired, feeling frustrated, feeling stressed, feeling, feeling burned out, feeling like it didn't matter, feeling like it didn't work, and sometimes all you need is somebody to come along and point you in the right direction. Ask your neighbor, where are you headed? Ask your other neighbor, where are you headed? It's an important question, and I'm grateful that Paul gives us a picture, a picture of how he sees progress. How cool is it that we not only get a narrative of Paul's missionary exploits in the book of Acts, but we have the letters that he wrote? Because in the book of Acts, we see what Paul did. In the letters that he wrote, we saw how he thought. And to me, that's really a privilege to get inside the head of one of the greatest thinkers in the world, in the history of the world, let alone one of the greatest Christians, one of the greatest minds. And we get in his head. And he's writing to the Philippian church. You know, he started this church in AD 50. He was going through on a missionary journey. And Philippi was the first church that he found it well, was the first one that he preached in in Europe. And so he goes through there and starts a church, and he visits, and he stops back by a, a few more times. But by the time he's writing the book of Philippians, there has been a turn of events, and Paul is in prison. Scholars debate as to whether Paul was in Caesarea or whether he was in Rome. I take the view that he was in Rome. And in Rome, he, he rented a house where he taught everybody who came to him. He was under a form of house arrest for preaching the gospel. And the Philippian church knew that he was in prison, but these latest developments had the community at the church at Philippi all shook up. And they're saying that there has been a setback for the gospel because Paul, who's kind of like the point guard for their team, is locked in prison. That's, that's kind of bad when your point guard is on the bench in the championship, and they're worried about it. And so Paul writes to them, and he says, I need you to know something about what has happened. What had happened was, Paul might say, he says, we need to talk about what has happened. And, and that, phrase, that, that phrase right there for everybody in the room would have a, a different meaning depending on the time in your life or the area of your life you apply it to. What happened when I was young? What happened in my first marriage? Or what, what happened that caused me to leave that job? What happened that caused that relationship to fail? What, what, what everybody say, what happened? Well, what happened was Paul got moved from his house arrest to the palace guard where they would keep the prisoners while they were waiting for the trial. And so the church at Philippi is hearing secondhand information. There wasn't good journalism in that day, very different than the day we live in where the journalism is accurate. But Paul, Paul said, no, I, I want you to hear this straight from me. What has happened? But then it's interesting because he doesn't go on to detail uh, what happened to him, which is weird. He goes, I want to talk to you about what has happened to me. But then, and I love this, and I'm excited to share it with you. I was telling them the last time I preached this that this is one of those sermons that if I wrote it just for myself, it was worth the time. I preached this stuff to, I watched this in the IMAX theater of my own mind before I present it to the general public viewing audience. 
And it got to me that, that Paul, instead of going on to describe what happened to him, which is he's falsely accused, which is he's been in prison for his faith. It doesn't describe so much what has happened, but instead he gives, and this is so important, an interpretation, not just of what has happened, because life really isn't about what happened to you. Life really isn't about what has happened. Life is more about what it means to me. And Paul is not going to spend the next 14 verses describing in detail what happened to him. He makes a swift transition. Can I teach this message? He makes a swift transition to say, instead of going into the details about what has happened, which is largely outside of my control, because there's a lot of things that happen to you that are in your control, but sometimes you get in a situation where there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And so Paul said, since I can't change the what, let me talk to you for a moment about the why. And he starts talking about the very first thing that your kids want to know. The moment they start learning to use their words to ruin your life. And what they want to know about every decision, every bedtime, every curfew, every rule is why. And then you get to invoke that great parental privilege of the response that every parent ought to use every chance you get while you can. And it starts with because, and it ends with I said so. And it feels good just to look at your kids and say, because I… This is not a courtroom. This is not a negotiation. I do not have to structure logic to help you understand my decision. It has been implemented by the highest court in the land. I said so. That's why. Pick it up. And they ask this question because it's the most important question of life. Why? 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 And of course, we grow out of this. We never ask God why when we go through anything. That's only children that do that. And so Paul, Paul says, life is less about this and more. don't realize how long this word is until you write it in front of 20,000 people. He said, let me give you, instead of a description of my current state, let me give you an interpretation of my state. You know what faith is? Faith is an interpretation. Faith is an interpretation. Paul's faith didn't change this. It changed this. Paul's, Paul's faith didn't affect this. It informed this. Now, one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit in my life is that he is my interpreter. He helps me take a situation, and instead of starting with what, I start with why. Instead of, instead of starting with what, I start with why. Here's the secret. You can survive any what if you have a good enough why. The reason people quit when, when all hell breaks loose is because they didn't have a strong enough why when they started. The reason that people get so confused when they get thrown in prison is because they didn't determine their purpose before they were behind bars. I can't tell if this is getting through to you, so help me and touch somebody next to you and tell them, you need a why. You need a why. And see, here's the thing. You can't depend on God to give you the why. He's already given you the why. I put you on earth to glorify me. 
So whatever happens to you, you already know the why before you see the what. Here's the key. Decide why before the what. Decide the why before the what. Decide the why before the why. I'm a repeated, I'm a redundant preacher. Decide the why. So if I go into a situation and I don't know what's going to happen, I already predetermined the why. I'm not waiting to find out why. I predecided why. I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to see his goodness revealed in my life. That's my why. Touch somebody say, you can't take my why. You can throw me in prison, but you can't take my why. You can disrupt my financial situation, but you can't take my why. You might even mess with my marriage, but you can't take my why. You can mess with my car, but you can't take my why. My why is my why. You can't have my why. I've got a deep motivation. I've got a sense of purpose. My life has a larger context. I'm here for the gospel. I'm here for his glory. I'm here to bring him pleasure. That's my why. That's my why. That's my why. There's no what in the world that can defeat you if you know your why. I got my why. That's how I survived. I survived on a why. The devil threw a lot of what at me, but I had my why intact before the what started happening, and I can make it through the what if I got a good why. So let's look at how God might want to adjust our interpretation. Touch somebody, say why. Why? That's the question. My dad had this funny thing he used to do. He would always interpret someone else's silence as judgment. And so he, he would tell me about somebody in the church, and he would say, He thinks he's better than me. And I would, I would say, why? why? Why do you think that? And he would say, because he walked right by me and didn't even speak to me. Did you consider that perhaps he had something on his mind? And my dad would hate you for seven years. In fact, a lady stopped me at the baseball field the other day, and I had taken uh, one of our kids to the bathroom, and I was walking out of the bathroom trying to get back to the field to watch my kid play, and the lady said, Well, just walk by me then, and don't even ask how I'm doing. Pastor. How many want to know my response? I simply said, right now, I'm dad more than I'm pastor. I don't care if you like it. That's what I said. I said, but hello, I didn't notice you. I was going to the bathroom. It's private, but hello. It is interpretation. I wasn't not thinking about her. I wasn't not speaking to her. I was going to the bathroom. Would you please stop drawing thought bubbles over other people's heads? This was part of Paul's issue. There were these other preachers who wanted to use his imprisonment as an opportunity to kind of like get ahead of Paul. And so they were preaching, but they were preaching with bad motives. And Paul said, It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter to me. The important thing is they're preaching Christ. Paul said, I'm so focused on my own motives, I don't have time to worry about anybody else's. A good marriage requires interpretation. Oh, yes. It is a cross cultural relationship, and you need an interpreter. You do. And the Lord will help you interpret it and say, You know, she didn't really say that because she's mad at you. She's just under a lot right now. And the Lord will help you with that. And it'll help you to forgive offenses. And it'll help you. I'm telling you, interpretation is everything in relationships, interpretation is everything when you face conflict. I can't count the number of times that I wake up on a Monday and two things go wrong, and I go, I guess it's going to be that kind of week. So I'm interpreting as an inconvenience, as an omen that the universe has conspired against me with the help of Lucifer himself. It's going to be one of those weeks. No, that's an interpretation. 
You are not experiencing life. You are experiencing your interpretation of life.